<laughs> so today, today we have uh, Bridget Nielsen joining us for Spirit Science Live. And Bridget, it's great to see you again. It's been a long time. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Jordan. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, you know, you've you've done quite a lot of work. Like you're a YouTuber. You have some online courses, and you talk about so many different things. Uh, everything from you know getting into like ancestral connections was one of the big ones that, that I I met you through. Yeah. Um, but also just like earth energy and even ET connection and all kinds of stuff like this. And I mean, I don't even know where to begin. Like based on actually, you know, this is, this is what's coming to me right in this moment is for, uh, you know, I don't know if you've noticed the last, uh, this year, pretty much in 2020 so far, we've had the U S government, the Pentagon kind of releasing a lot of information about ETs, about sightings, UFOs. Oh, suddenly we have a crashed ship and everything. And it's like, come on, you've had that for like 60 years plus. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, they're getting ready to, to, re to reveal something. It's like a child almost, right? Like, like <laughs> just they'll tell us when they're ready. Um, yes. Maybe they're planning to scare everybody or something. But um, I mean, what do you make of that whole thing? I mean, I make of it that it's, it's time it can't be held back anymore. I mean, there's a lot of truth on many different levels being revealed right now in all different facets of economics and health and all these different categories. And I think when one thing kind of breaks and can't be controlled or needs to be released and disclosed, as does all the other categories. And so I, kind of, I feel like it's also like, okay, we need to start really starting moving and releasing and disclosing because there's so much there. <laughs> and then also I do think that there is a piece to it of that there is a lot of distraction going into a lot of other categories. So it's like, hey, we did say it. You just maybe missed it. You know, that piece as well. Um, but it's, it's time, you know. And I think that that's what 2020 is showing us is the breakdown of the matrix structures and all the different categories and that we're ready to shake and move and restructure our entire global system and every perspective that we have about life, you know? Definitely. I'm, I'm very curious to hear your perspective on like, you know, with this disclosure and all this information, everything like that. Um, if you're, are you familiar with uh, Werner von Braun's prophecy, uh, who was like the top Nazi scientist for Hitler, um, like 60 years ago? Do you know about like what he said on his deathbed about UFOs and the controlling of everybody? No, what did he say? So he basically described that there were three phases to the controlling of the world, and it involved scaring people in three distinct ways. And the first way was through the communists. The communists were like the bad guys, the villains. They were going to, you know, uh, be the, the terrorists of the world. And then the terrorists were the next one of like the, you know, the 9-11 and Al-Qaeda and, and, and all of these kind of groups and everything. And then the last one was going to be what he described as a hoaxed alien attack. Mm -hmm. That the, the secret government or the military, you know, who had these technologies, had these crafts, these very advanced vessels and stuff, would, uh, they would basically use that technology to attack humanity and that it would ultimately like kind of get, my understanding was that it would kind of rally everybody together against a universal common threat. But mm. in that, but in that there was a, you know, this sort of thing of, uh, that that's how they would instigate the new world order and they would have like, you know, mass imposed control on every society across the world and everything like this. And so then the question becomes, okay, with all these UFOs and these Pentagon releasing sightings, the question is, is it even real? And I'm wondering if you have any, you know, or is it just them like priming us for their own attack? Because my understanding is that if aliens are malevolent, they're going to be manipulating us through energy and consciousness rather than like a direct full frontal assault, like all the conspiracies about reptiles. Um, and that actually benevolent uh, aliens who might come here through, um, you know, in spaceships would probably be benevolent. And so, yeah, my, my question is, I'm wondering is like, do you think that it's real that all these sightings or do you think it's just a part of this bigger picture, this bigger plan? Um, all of the above. I, there, there's so much there that you, that was really great. I love that. Um, I think that there is a certain, you know, faction and stuff that wants to create like a big alien attack. I can see that as part of the agenda. There's been lots of other agendas that haven't worked out. So that's why I say 
it's, it's determined by I'm into the timeline parallel reality uh, perspective where we can shift to a more positive timeline. But I do think that there is a timeline that is kind of setting itself up right now with the energies to do that. And for me, I, I'm with you 100% on that the extraterrestrials or any entities would just work through energy. You know, they can just communicate right through our organs, like right through our energetic system. They don't, yeah, have to scare us with something in front of us. And the narratives have been set up to orient um, contact as more of a negative experience, though there are a lot of positive ones too, but generally, you know, all of the alien attacks in LA, like there's been, what, 10 of those movies or something? Um, yeah. But I think that it's really... I feel like that's part of my purpose. I feel like that's what you've been doing for years, whether it's directly connected to talking about extraterrestrials or not, but it's the preparation of consciousness uh, and the, the affirming of it and the, the confirming of people's experiences that there is more than just the five senses over time and that the dreams are communicating something to the degree that people, if there is a fake alien attack, or with whatever's happening, they already know. You know, most people, the statistics of just even mainstream America is that most people know that extraterrestrials or life on other planets exist. That, that's already, like, common. People are, like, in agreement about that. And so it's developing that greater knowingness and that greater discernment so that when exterior circumstantial ha things happen, like they're happening a lot in 2020, then we get to be like, oh, but I've already had contact in my dreams. I've already remembered my experiences. I, I can already tap into the consciousness and, and know that this is something fake or know that this is something that doesn't resonate with me, right? So I think that that's been the preparation since 2012 and before preparing a lot of people to be stewards right now for whatever the outside circumstances hand us, right? So that we're in alignment with our own inner truth and discernment. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, because you talk a lot about ET connections anyways, like yeah. what do you, um, what is your method for connecting with, with ETs in maybe a more mystical or psychic way? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's always been pretty natural. Um, I would say that generally for myself and a lot of other people, dream time is the easiest modes of communication particularly like lucid dreaming or people have dream paralysis, you know, the spectrum of dream time is a really great way where we're not as fixed on in our conscious mind and egos to receive that communication. Um, and a lot can be delivered there. So I find that for me, dream time communication um, is the primary. Um, and then for me also going to sacred sites that have, a certain frequency or certain dimensional gate energies and like heightened ley lines, those definitely trigger those kinds of contact experiences or those kinds of communications. I'm just more accessible to it in those land spaces as well. And then the third thing that <laughs> is kind of surprising, but I've noticed over time is that when I'm doing my personal work, that is seemingly completely unrelated to extraterrestrials or seemingly unrelated to a spiritual experience. Like, okay, I'm really going to break through this negative pattern in relationships, or I'm going to put myself out there in this way that I've been scared to do. Like, so those kind of breakthrough moments, those dissolving of negative patterns, when I have something like that, all of a sudden it opens up obviously new levels of my awareness and consciousness to flow more in a more beautiful way that then leads to contact or that then leads to communication with spiritual beings. So it, it's not like kind of the fun novel way where I'm like, okay, see SETI, like let's do a contact meditation. But it's like by doing our personal work, it actually leads to more contact. So those have been my primary ways that have been easy to communicate. Yeah, that happened. Actually, that happened to me recently. I went out for a run and I had had some cannabis and I sat like I, I found this really nice cliff overlooking the mountains that I'm where I live. And uh, and so I sat in meditation and then started thinking about like I had received once uh, in a ayahuasca ceremony, I'd received this DNA, this like triple helix DNA Merkaba that was really cool. 
So I just started feeling into that and focusing on that. And suddenly these two aliens kind of showed up in my experience and they looked kind of like tall, silvery grays, but of course more silver and like very kind in their nature and their energy. Mm -hmm. Um, But they were like showing me how like they were like passing their hands like this through the the three stranded DNA and like two of them stayed really solid. And the third strand, that like additional strand was like becoming just energy instead of the the thing and and kind of like floating around. And they were like, look, you know, you got to keep working on this because it needs to solid that third strand needs to solidify. It needs grounding. It's not solid Mm. yet. We can, we can mess with it easily. So that's Mm. like, that was a really amazing little encounter experience that I had just sitting, you know, in meditation. And I, I wanted, I'm curious, like, do you have like a a top or a number one sort of like a ET encounter or, experience or that they like told you something or anything that like really stands out to you in your memories is like something really powerful? Yeah. Um, I have, I have like quite a few, but I'll do my most standout, um, (laughs) would be, (laughs) would be, um, in Sedona. Um, we were doing a contact meditation and it was specifically, you know, connect your pineal gland with the spaceship above us right now kind of thing. And I've done so many of these meditations. I don't have like high expectations of some profound life changing thing happening. So I was like, okay, let's do this. And straight up the spaceship did (laughs) connect with my pineal gland and released so, so much DMT in my brain. Naturally, this was just like a spontaneous experience that I experienced the simultaneity of all the parallel reality probabilities of that space which is a landing pad in Sedona so I experienced contact happening in that location simultaneous I experienced my different incarnations and different stars happening all at the same time and then this incredible like universal love just like pouring down through me and I was completely gone and came back just you know this sobbing emotional blissed out wreck and everyone else is completely silent it was like a giant group meditation and that and the alien the biggest thing too was that the alien consciousness within me woke up i think that that's one of the big things that we're working with in this time is this idea of it being out there this this extraterrestrial out there or these people doing this thing out there and it's and the the extraterrestrial consciousness of my dna of my connections woke up in me and literally it felt like an alien was in me which was me and um it was profound and it lasted, you know, the energy 24 hours. And I woke up the next day and my clairvoyance turned on. So it was pretty significant. And, um, I think that it's one of those things where it was this perfect meeting, you know, I had gotten myself and I had taken action towards, uh, my soul mission. And I had done like the work to align with that timeline for that to happen. Um, and I can't just make it happen, but it's like meeting our appointments is what it very much so felt like. Mm, that's so interesting. That's really cool. Very beautiful. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I'm on that, like just on the flip side, have you ever had any encounters with like negative, like the dark ETs, if you know, if malevolent ones or anything like that? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I do find that it's very dependent on my vibration, right? Um, I was doing this more energy um, clearing exercise and there were kind of some energies that came into my dream time and a being came, it was more of a clairvoyant experience, but a being like came as I was releasing like kind of like one last lash. But I felt the way that I felt it more um, is what you were speaking to, which is kind of just that energetic infiltration that's very subtle um, because there's your own energy, your own consciousness. And then there's like the influences energetically from outside. And so I got to this point where um, discerning different kinds of energies, discerning, discerning different kinds of beings that um, I could feel at different times when like a reptilian presence would kind of like come in and, and it wouldn't be, it would be trying to alter my own perspective of myself or bring in more negativity, more kind of negative patterns to particularly what they call like lushing to kind of drain and suck your life force energy. And I had woken and I was so happy when I woke up and I was like, I'm feeling great. And then all of a sudden this, these kind of darker thoughts came in and this certain energy. And then I just went, 
hey, this is not me and this is not mine. What is this? And then it was like, it, I felt the reptilian consciousness and it was like, you're not allowed here. Bye. You know, like I'm not agreeing to this. And I think that it's that declaration of free will and that awareness and consciousness that then they can't do it. But if you're unconscious, then it's much more easy. So I find that the negative things have just been more like the subtle kind of negative um, energies, but that can be easily, you know, washed away once we just become aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, w would you say that then like, you know, looking at more of the, uh, the conspiracies of control, kind of just bringing it back to, you know, our hoax alien attack and the government and the, just the sort of the, the whole like, you know, new world order conspiracy kind of thing. Do you feel like that, like that nefarious reptilian energy is like at the, at the core or the root of everything? Or do you think there's something else that's kind of influencing us uh, or that like wants to impose control in a different way? Uh, I would say in my experience, it's a primary. I wouldn't say that it's nearly like all reptilians doing this, but I would say it's the reptilian level of consciousness, right? It's uh, that reptilian yeah. energy, like the fear energy. So it might not be actual reptilians in some cases, definitely. Yes, as well. Um, but I would, I would say so. And I feel like it's connected to, yeah, a lot of the different agendas and, you know, the addictions to social media and the different technologies and different things going on. And, but when we're conscious, when we're aware and when we stay present, it's, it can't touch us, you know, but it's easy. We're, we're kind of, we're malleable humans, you know? So it takes that extra attention and, um, attentiveness, I think, to, to stay present. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I had just on this last, probably last thing here, subject of the reptiles, like I had this one experience um, that was really interesting. I just have to share with you, which is, uh, it was, you know, like Canada legalized cannabis in like 2018. And it was the night of that, uh, of that legalization. And I remember just, I was in the office, I was like there alone, um, just working on some videos or whatever. And I was definitely pretty baked. But I had this feeling of like, I really want to stay up like all night on this. Like, I really want to work on this, uh, this project and just like really, you know, I think it was the Sumerian epic too. So um, it was, you know, very, I was very passionate about it. And so I decided to take some mushrooms to keep myself awake and pull an all-nighter in the office there. And so it was interesting because I, I you know, I, I had the mushrooms and like 30, 40 minutes later, um, I just felt myself, you know, like lifting into this higher consciousness or higher, you know, frequency of awareness. And then suddenly, like kind of off in the distance, there were these two beings that came like scampering over to me and they looked at me and they looked, they looked like reptiles, but mixed with like the, uh, if you've ever, you, you ever watched SpongeBob? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like those sardines that are just always like in the Krusty Krab and they're like, kind of like their faces are, it's just like vertical heads and they're like facing up. They're like, you know, crab patties or whatever they say. I don't know. Um, but it looked kind of like that, but like, like kind of like a cartoony reptile creature. Yeah. And they, and they were fully like almost as if they were dressed as police officers. Um, and I was, and, and they came up to me and they were like, wait a second, you can see us. You're not on cannabis. What's going on here? And then I just kind of looked at them and then I was like, I don't know what's happening. And they were like, oh, you took mushrooms. Okay. Just, <laughs> they kind of, they kind of like, you know, looked at me and they pointed their finger and then they were like, okay, well, you know, we're going to get back to our work or something. And they like scampered off. And it, but like the whole vibe that I got from it was that like with, with mass cannabis usage, especially that night, that there were like higher dimensional beings sort of policing the consciousness, so like policing the, the, the where people went with the cannabis, but that cannabis wouldn't let them see these beings, but like the mushrooms opened my eye to be able to receive them. And, and that kind of shocked them because they weren't expecting that or something. And that was like this very strange, curious experience. But the thing was, is I didn't get this feeling from them that like they were bad. It just felt like they were like, kind of like reptile astral cops. And it, it kind of made me wonder like, is there, you know, could there be even like, as far as, you know, we, we often in the new age circles or in the conspiracies, you know, like the reptilians are the bad guys. And I'm wondering like, could there be like good reptiles too? Or is this, you know, were they, they were like powerless to do anything 
and you know it wasn't they weren't there to fight me so it wasn't just there was no clashing of interest or whatever i don't know but it was very it was a very interesting experience that is so cool and funny yeah isn't it? <laughs> you know? yes i love that and i mean in my experience definitely there's so many different facets of even reptilian you know i mean there are i've heard of benevolent reptilians i've interacted with them i've had friends that are deep contactees interact with them there's ones that are like hey i don't want to be negative anymore you know and are actually like how do i do this other energy there's ones that are super benevolent and and have physically um been in contact with some of my other friends to give benevolent technologies to earth mm -hmm. and assist so it isn't a one that that's why we need to do the energetic checking in it's not just like reptilian bad you know it's it we've kind of gotten into i think this um oversimplified identification i think maybe through christianity right it's like devil bad angel oh, good yeah. and it's like yeah, snake yeah it's more complex than that like let's say and and the nuance is what's really important so i definitely have yeah i've i've felt both and i know what you're talking about where you kind of infiltrate dimensions and then they're like what are you doing here you're not supposed to be here <laughs> <That's> <laughs> funny thing yeah. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I think it's really fascinating as well. Like, uh, have you, have you ever read DMT, the spirit molecule? Yes. Yeah. Like I, I really found a lot of value in that and was like, wow, more like scientists everywhere need to read this. Like Neil deGrasse Tyson, you need to read this, you know, like, because there's that, you know, just general denial of, um, anything beyond what we can perceive or, or sort of a big question mark, but it's, you know, the conversation of as if we can perceive it, you know, a fourth dimension, fifth dimension sort of thing often is met with this ridicule, skepticism kind of energy. But like after all of the DMT spirit molecule experiments, Dr. Rick Strassman, everything that he wrote, he was like, he's like, I tried to rationalize that like all of these experiences people were having and like seeing consistently seeing aliens or going into spaceships or seeing these other worlds, you know, like trying to rationalize, oh, that's just some part of the subconscious that's making itself known through visualization and da da da. But it, there were, the, the experiences were so numerous and so many and so consistent with each other that the only way for him to actually like make any sense of it at all was to acknowledge that he had no idea what was going on and mm -hmm. to, to kind of surrender to the idea that like, maybe there is actually something here. And, you know, when, whenever he would try and Tell so someone said, "Oh, that there was an alien, and he put something in my arm, or something like that." It happened one time. There was like a, you know, like a psychic surgery on the DMT. You know, if if Rick Strassman tried to say, um, like, well, maybe that was just a part of your subconscious, the person would be like, "No, it was real," and they would get like a pushback. So he was like, "No, I'm just gonna like treat it like that." And what he ended up coming up with was a very profound theory of like dark matter and dark energy. You know, these like these these different worlds in existence, you know, that we can kind of measure through the gravitational effects in science, but we can't uh, see and perceive in any kind of way that like, maybe those are the realms that we're going to when we mm -hmm. take DMT or we, we have a, a psychedelic or a lucid experience, you know, a, a, a psychic dreaming or, uh, or, or astral projection kind of thing. Like maybe that's part of the bridge there. And I, I just found that to be like, so critically important for us as a species to like, look mm. at you know now mm -hmm. now nowadays yeah that's beautiful and it's so true i mean that's the best place to start is to realize that we don't know it all <laughs> to be like yeah i don't know but i'm going to observe and be open and then see where this takes me and i i love that he did that and is yeah. doing that so and we really do need to rewrite so much that i think going to that place of surrender and keeping it in a place of for me like curiosity where it's not like oh i just don't know anything and kind of this kind of victim or feeling bad you know or something but it's more like i'm curious let's see what this is you know yeah yeah and absolutely explore from that way yeah yeah and i i love just kind of going you know one of the things that you described kind of at the beginning and you know all of the UFOs and ETs and everything like what that is leading to you were describing as you know really the awakening of consciousness and all the ways that it needs to be and maybe some of it's really dark or whatever but it's that's kind of the process and I know that that's kind of what you've spoken about a lot of like on your YouTube channel and stuff of like that consciousness awakening and connecting with the earth and like the wild self you know and all of these things and um, I was wondering maybe if you just kind of break into that a little bit and like you know 
what would be some of the most important tools that you can think of that would help people with grappling with this awakening of consciousness experience and, and maybe ETs, maybe not, you know, just, but like the awakening of consciousness in general, like, yeah, what, what do you, what do you prescribe if someone comes to you and says like, I'm looking for, I need some help with my, you know, awakening, my grounding, all of that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I mean, to be honest, because especially I think in both of our worlds that in this world of new age and, and like awakening, there can be, especially with the, the indigo starseed kids, all of, you know, our generations that are just so tapped in and utilizing different like tools to tap in that it becomes like so expansive and again, very out there. And what I've learned from the extraterrestrials over the years and the guidance that they've given me is, um, they just like show me a mirror and they're like, um, you're on earth and you're here for a reason and you got this, but very much so focus here and now and focus on the earth, you know, because that other stuff will open up, but it will only open up if you really own your citizenship to earth, that you are human and allowing those pieces to be just as relevant and just as beautiful and precious and significant as, you know, the star, star seed aspect of myself or this consciousness in this realm, dimensional gate that I opened yesterday. And that is, it's humbling, but it also fully allows space for integration. Cause it literally, like, as we're talking about it, even the energy comes back in and then we realize that we are it, like we are the thing that we've been waiting for. And that's extremely empowering. And so for me, it is very much so in how we utilize our everyday and what we do with our time and what we're creating physically and energetically for this new world and how we engage and treat earth and fellow humans. So it's, it seems like disconnected and that's why my work's been very interesting because it was like extremely galactic, but it's led me back funny enough to earth and to being human and appreciating that and realizing that that's uh, an integral piece before we can actually go fully galactic and cosmic. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I like that. That resonates a lot. And I mean, I guess, does that relate with like, you know, you, you even have courses on an ancestral connections and yeah. that sort of thing. Like, do you relate ancestral connections as if it's just reintegrating parts of yourself or that it's, you know, you're kind of healing or working with the, the energies of your ancestors, but maybe it's, it's not directly you, but maybe it's in, you know, it's a part of your DNA or it's in your body system in some way. Yes, both. So it's very <laughs> much so. Yeah. I mean, it's healing a part of you. So it's like a soul retrieval, you know, that could happen in any great category of past lives or inner child work or, you know, ancestral, it really is integrating back to wholeness. Um, but particularly, I mean, humanity is extremely jacked up. Like we're, we're a mess <laughs> and, and part of that perpetuation of as to why, even if we have like such good pure intentions and we even like came to earth with like clarity about our mission and everything, there's this stickiness that literally comes as we incarnate or like when we're in, you know, just conceived this morphogenetic phenomenon, this like energetic phenomenon of passing on that encodement from our ancestry as we then come into life. And so all of a sudden you're like, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And then it's like this kind of heaviness and fog that follows and in different healing schools and trainings, it's that over 50% of our issues are inherited from, from our ancestors. And then there's a big piece, which I've been working on, which is connected to um, pregnancy and how you were during pregnancy and then your birth and then your connection to mother. So that's another significant piece. And so those pieces are necessary for me on the, on the healing path and the awakening path, because even though we can tap and perceive like the greater soul mission and our gifts and like how to move forward, it's kind of like we have weights or like, we're, you know, trudging along through this other field, or we can't fully embody or feel really safe in that to move forward because of this other stuff. 
So I've noticed that it's a, it's just kind of like a critical piece along the journey to look at that. And it's also when we heal ourselves, we are healing other people. And particularly when we do the work ourselves, it, that transmission is available. It's an invitation through the whole genetic line. Mm -hmm. So it's a profound way that like when people are doing the work, it literally is, is accessible to everyone and can make big, mini collective, mini cultural collective shifts that then can lead to bigger collective shifts. So it's, I've found it to be like a really amazing web way of healing on a collective level and an individual level simultaneously. Yeah. Do you think that that also affects the ancestors in the past, like, like sort of in a time travel kind of sense of like, you know, they, they say that uh, quantum particles, you know, in, in, in science, like move forward and backward, backwards through time and space, that maybe in some subtle way, you know, you're doing some healing that's related to your great, great grandfather or something, that when you do that work, it affects him back, you know, back when he was alive, or maybe after he died or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I would say yes, because when I've done the work with my ancestors and such, there's certain ancestors that are like, no, they're like stubborn and they're not, they don't want to move. <laughs> they don't want to heal, you know? And then there's other ones that are like, oh yes, I've just been, I didn't know what to do. Like I didn't have the resources, like, thank you so much, you know? And so I do feel like it's shifting those timelines even for them, which then comes back down to us. So we're doing both simultaneous. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but with simultaneous parallel incarnations or past lives, um, I've had it to where some of them, whether they're natives or witchy kind of magician, other lives that I have that are aware of me because that's part of their theme in that life is to be aware of other incarnations too. And I have felt that particularly with my like witch lives that I'm like, Hey, I'm like a woman in this life. I get to express, I ain't getting killed. And, and they can feel that and that heals them in that time because they're like, oh, like this, this time is really challenging, but at least another expression of me is getting to experience that. So I do, I have had that experience. Have you had anything like that? Um, you know, it's interesting when regarding like working with ancestors, um, I feel like I haven't, I've only had one direct experience, which was the first time that I went to Rhythmia with ayahuasca. And um, I had just had this very profound sort of, I guess, Christ consciousness awakening experience. But then what happened was I um, kind of traveled back in time to my biological father's funeral and he had killed himself about a month after I was conceived. And uh, I only started learning because of the ayahuasca, how that affected me even from in the womb. And uh, I went back to his funeral and saw him like kind of pacing uh, up and down the aisles, you know, at the, at the church and was just like, what have I done? What have I done? And then he went off. I found kind of followed his footsteps into the void, like out into space, into this black blackness where there were not even any stars. There were no planets. There was nothing. It was just a complete black void. And I found him pressed up against an invisible wall, like banging on an invisible wall, just like crying in agony for like, this mistake that he felt like he made because he, mm. you know, it was, you know, this filled with regret and I kind of appeared to him and revealed myself as his, as his child. And when he recognized me, uh, he shattered into a prism of light and a pr just prisms and they kind of like twinkled into, into stardust and disappeared. And I, um, I didn't hear anything else from him for, you know, the rest of the ceremony and then the next ceremony, but then the final ceremony of the week, uh, I remember like having this just kind of falling asleep at one point. And then kind of, as I was waking up, it was like, I was in this very cosmic swirl of energy and that he, it was like his presence was there, like something like he had been released and he was like reintegrating with the, mm. with the all. So it was probably not, not as direct of an experience. Um, but uh, as to what you described, but maybe similar in a way, but that's kind of the only real ancestral work I think that I've really done or I've experienced so far anyways. But it's so powerful. How did that yeah. feel to you? Like getting to experience your it was dad power in that sense. It, it was powerful. Yeah, no, it was, it was very moving. And it was actually, it was very, it's interesting too, just to relate this with like 
Um, at Rhythmia, you know, one of the things that Jerry describes is that the Colombian tradition uh, who practice the ayahuasca ceremonies believe that um, when you come here, when you're incarnated here, you come here on three, well, two sort of three wavelengths. One is like your parents' DNA. So that's how it's kind of two is like your mom's DNA and their, and you know, in that lineage, your father's DNA and that lineage. And then you have like your soul's DNA and your own lineage. And that like, mm. there could be problems on any one of those st strands of, of, of historical lifetimes over lifetimes of DNA, mm. I guess, you know, quantum DNA, I don't know if that's a word, but, um, but like, now. so that <laughs> it is now. So, so that like through the ceremonies, in addition to working on yourself in the moment, that when you go back in time or you're going through like ancient lifetimes, you could be healing, you know, issues in the, in the, the time stream for your, for your father's line, your mother's line, or your own line, um, and that you're like this fusion of the three. And, um, you know, it, that, well, I guess for first, I'll just like kind of share that. It's like, does that reflect your experiences as well in that same work? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I've, I've seen that. And that's, yeah, I've, I've had those experiences and I relate to that and it feels resonant for sure. And I want to speak to your father's experience, which is that part of it, like part of the healing, <laughs> which is kind of universal. It's not just ancestral, but it's particularly evident in the ancestral is just, just to be seen the acknowledgement of that. So like you getting to see that there was regret and that that's like where he was literally set him free. Mm -hmm. And that, that's profound. Like, otherwise, you're, it, it's to be witnessed, right? It's to be acknowledged, it's to be seen. And that in and of itself brings awareness, which then sets it free and allows the energy to move, which was completely your experience, you know? And <laughs> so, um, so that's really what we're wanting to do. And that's as we go through these different time streams of, yeah, soul, mom's line, dad's line, these connections, it's like, all this really wanted is for it's to be seen, acknowledged, like valued, and then the energy can move. And that's, that's really kind of one of the big bases of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and sort of following in that, the, the other thing that you kind of reminded me of both related to my experience as well as if you were describing kind of how the, the child is affected in the womb. Um, this is something I've been really going into a lot uh, deeper lately, which is Bruce Lipton's work and the biology of belief. Um, and like, I think that most people are unaware of just how like if between the, the age of conception to like between six and eight into nine ish, mm -hmm. like a child is just like a sponge of energy. Mm -hmm. They're, they're not even really cognitively able to, to conceptualize things and think of things independently, but they, they receive everything so deeply. And I think that we often take for granted just how much that environment affects a child's growth and stuff like that. So when you have, you know, what uh, teachers or psychologists might call like problem child, problem children or whatever, it's kind of like, well, I mean, like we have to look at all the factors into why they're struggling. And more often than not, it's like the, the, there's something going on with the environment or there was something in the environment that triggered so much trauma that it, you know, they programmed within themselves this very destructive mindset or a very, you know, disconnected mindset or something like that, that affected the, the entire life that they have. And it's not usually until many, many years later that the, you know, kids will often like actually like start to question that and start to look into that if they ever do at all. And I mean, we can probably attribute a lot of the, the suffering and the chaos of the world today just being like, look at all of the ways that we were raised over the past generation to generation, to generation, and that sort of thing. I'm kind of, it's, it's like my journey is honing me in on like the most significant points that can then assist us in being our true selves, you know, without any resistance. And it's honing me in on the birth piece, really, um, definitely for my experience. But Gabor Mate, have you heard of Gabor Mate? Yeah, I yeah. love him. Yeah, he's great. And his, I mean, there's a direct correlation in his work and his studies to ADHD and addiction and this like childhood trauma. And it's like, I guess when we, when we start saying that, especially in the new age world, it's like, no, I don't want to like, what? No, I don't have any of that. I don't remember anything happening to me, but it's all, like you said, this sponge, super somatic, like nervous system, subtle energies that we didn't even know were happening that then influence us. And 
Um, and for me in that, it was very much so connected to well, with the ancestral work and then the birth piece. I mean, before I, when I was age 20, I, I mean, you were going like early on in life. I, I have always been very proud of you in doing that. But like when I was 20, I couldn't even talk. Like I couldn't even express myself because there was so much like suppression and certain other things like relationship challenges and issues and like taking on too much and overgiving or some of these like patterns that I was like, what is this and where is this coming from? And it took doing the ancestral work and like the birth piece to realize like, oh, that it was like this suppressed like energy in my ancestors. And it was this, um, this wanting to give to my mom who was in these challenging situations during pregnancy and birth, this giving, 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 that then translated into my romantic relationships. And so even though it's like, well, how do those connect? And we don't even remember that those things happened. And so it seems disconnected or we don't know how to relate them, but it's amazing when you start going in these directions and just taking a look into these things and seeing how much they can absolutely change your everyday life now, which was very surprising to me, but I'm really grateful for it because <laughs> it's changed me. So Definitely. Definitely. And um, now I was told that you kind of coined a term uh, oh, right. by one of our mutual, by one of our mutual friends, uh, Ben yeah. Burke. And he told me, he told me that, that, um, you coined the term hybrid children. I guess I, I mean, I don't know if I did technically, I think there was a few other like channels, a woman in Australia, Bashar, but I definitely was a proponent and I would say I made it more mainstream. We'll, we'll say that. <laughs> so what is a hybrid child? So from the extraterrestrial experimentation and abduction programs, um, there were children that were made with our genetics, with human genetics, and with um, extraterrestrial genetics, particularly gray genetics. But we have to remember that within our genetics, we've got, you know, most of the galaxy at least within us. So, um, you know, they can extract this Pleiadian genetic and this archetypal genetic thing here, right? And, um, and part of the story of that, so through these abduction programs, these kids were created to create other civilizations that have gone on now, um, and also to return for part of first contact protocol. So that these, the idea is, is that, you know, as we just said, some reptilian dude flying in on a spaceship might not be the most palatable to most humans as like a first time contact experience, but like a little alien hybrid child that is connected to your genetics is much more palatable and much more uh, receivable as like an intermediary connection to first contact. So that's part of why it's, it's a part of that protocol. And also to start connecting like the galactic, our greater galactic family with us humans physically, not just like, hey, we're connected, but actually like kind of merge the civilizations. Um, so I was having tons of these contact memories through dream time and um, realized that I was a part of this. And at the time too, I was helping a lot of clients because I was doing a lot of healing work and all of the abductees kept coming to me. And I was so good. I went to the other women in my healing training and I'm like, do you have abductees? Why do I have abductees? And they're like, nope, we, we don't have any. I'm like, what is this? And then I realized that I was a part of it too and just went down kind of this rabbit hole. And there's been lots of studies done on it where it's a consistent thing. Like you said, with the DMT experiences, it's like, wow, this is consistent. People are having these experiences, you know? And so a lot of people have had these experiences and are a part of this program and it's one of the things happening, you know, on earth. So, hmm. so I'm, I'm curious then when you talk about this program, this is like a physical thing that people like did experiments yeah. with DNA and that kind of thing. Like how would someone, if someone wants to research this and look into it, um, how would they find out about it? Um, you can look through, I mean, cause there's like the alien abduction part, you know, and that had, there was, there's different factions of all these different things, right? You know, the military made agreements with the greys to do this with humanity. And there were certain pockets of like 
particularly the Western world that were used in these experiments for these certain things. And then there were like other parts of the program that were more connected to these hybrid children and such. Um, so you can look, you can research alien abduction. That's a good place to start. Um, what is her name? Oh, there's a woman in Australia that's done a lot of research. I'll, her name will come to me in a minute. Um, about this and done actually like has statistics, has stories, has all these like, all these pieces. I've done a lot of it. It's not like actually formatted in a way. Um, my, my connection had been more energetically with these children. And so I have a website, Hybrid Children Community, that you can go to and like read about these different kids and these different energies and, um, and parents' experiences with meeting them um, and different things like that. So that's, that's been more of my prim primary was connecting with these children. Um, yes, so. Very interesting. Well, I wrote down Hybrid Children Community. Is that like just that .com? And yeah, .org, okay, that I think. Yeah. Dot org. Well, yeah, I'm going to just add that here. That sounds very interesting. I'm going to definitely gonna look into that. So, okay. So my next question then is that this is just following in this, cause this is very fascinating to me. You know, one of the things that I'm very focused on learning about and just exploring both within myself and in, uh, in modern science and in ancient uh, literature and ancient mythology and stuff is this idea of ascension, you know, like, mm -hmm. and what that means, because it means something different to everybody. It seems like ascension, meaning like, you know, just raising your vibration and living a better life to all the way to like the, the whole world passes into another dimension and we all become 5D beings or ascension kind of like a very more direct, like Jesus, you know, you, you put in the effort, you do the work and uh, you can start to, you know, experience greater and greater levels of miracles. Like many people are experiencing miracles every day, but getting to that point where you can experience the walking on water or, or, or raising people from the dead or, you know, levitating and flying around and that sort of thing. And so I'm really curious, like, you know, as far as this like hybrid children thing goes, I mean, do you see in the future or foresee any sort of like anybody possibly developing any kind of what you might call like super normal abilities or becoming like X-Men, you know, like, like, you know, mutants in that sense, or like having, being able to do things that are, would be considered by scientists today to be impossible. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, it's just classic siddhas, right? You know, the, the experience of having like these spontaneous, whatever your spontaneous um, Siddha or gift is to arise through your awakening process. Um, and I definitely think that it's possible. I mean, people are having these experiences. One of my, one of the teachers that I liked for a while, one of his students fully um, mastered teleportation. And it was, he was caught on like Japanese news, like teleporting, like in a met, in like a metro or whatever, um, to the degree that like he was famous, he is famous in Japan for doing this. And his Siddha spontaneously um, awoke in him. And it was this, I mean, it's different for each person. Um, during the, there was some earthquake in Japan and the whole like kind of town was like in shambles and crumbled and people were dying. So it just all of a sudden came up in him so that he could teleport these people to the hospital and back. Oh, like, but did boom, he lose boom. the... Did he lose no. the ability after? No. So he can still do this now? Yeah. Could we have him on a call and have him teleport in my, into my room, like on a camera? I don't know. I mean, I don't know him personally, but. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's famous there. And like he does like group circles of like hundred, with hundreds of people and like teaches and everything Whoa. like that. But he had done, before this happened, he had done a crap ton of deep deep you know spiritual work and like gone yeah. through it and i think that that's like a big part of it is again we as more sensitive indigos or crystals like we can perceive the reality where we do those kinds of things and so it's like oh i'm so close because i can feel it and what i've realized over the years is it's like there is a chop wood carry water there is a dedication and discipline to the practices over time and there is a, humi a humility required to look at these other parts of ourselves, like literally like, okay, you know, my ancestral this or like my childhood this and like looking at that and doing those different pieces and making sure to express our gifts 
So it's practical, like on a very human level, and then doing the deep esoteric work, I feel like it's required. I mean, there's some people that just like are anomalies and that's cool, but it's a very rare percentage. It does require the work um, to get there. And then, and the thing is, is the work is what helps the people be able to handle it when they have the gifts or when they have the experiences, you know, like certain, like that one sober DMT thing that I said earlier of, you know, this contact simultaneously and all this happening, that wasn't even on plant medicine, but it, it required me to have had enough different kinds of experiences and dream time and done enough different kinds of meditations to be able to handle that experience. And so I think that that's another piece that's important too, is the work along the way is the prerequisite so that when these bigger things happen, we can handle it, you know, like, all of a sudden I can like talk and see like into complete other dimensions and I can't turn it off. You know, like these kinds of experiences, we need to know how to navigate that. And that's what these steps along the way teach us. And so for me, it's finding paths towards that. There's so many different paths towards right awakening and ascension. And um, for me, it would be like the full, these activation of, my soul potential, my genetic potential, which would then, I, I don't know what that looks like because I'm not fully there yet, but it would be to the point where I am, I can, I perceive myself as beyond this incarnation, but in all time spaces simultaneously is like this greater soul experience. And because I understand my universal infinity and oneness, I can create reality. Like I can, I can, I'm a creator being at that point. Yeah. So that's part of what it feels like to me. That's crazy. Um, so just really quick, because I'm really curious and I'm going to look this up. Like I made a, I made a note of this guy cause I want to see videos of him teleporting. I, that's like on YouTube and it hasn't been blocked or taken down or anything like that. I don't know. I did, okay. This was like a few years ago that I know that that like that they caught him on video doing this, but I don't know what they got going on in Japan, you know, but I'll uh, figure out okay. his name and then let you know for sure. I can't remember what it is offhand. I'm not a name person. I'm it a, sounds can, so, oh, sorry. Yeah. I think I so keep going. No, it's good. Um, it just sounds, it's so fascinating to me because that's exactly kind of just like, it feels like that's my part of my calling is, at the very least, like just to figure it out or to do the work and to explore it. And, um, you know, at the same time, I've really been, I've been called out by a friend who, you know, just called out my own ego and was like, you seem to have like a bit of a, like a neediness energy going on. I was like, oh, well, that's, thank you. You know, cause I couldn't see it before. So it was, it, it's really got me into this like humble place of just like wanting to talk about it, explore it. You know, if, if this spontaneous thing happens or anything, that's like really beautiful, but also like, you know, I could live my full life and, and, and never uh, ex experience anything like that myself and be completely content within myself. And so that's just like sharing a little bit of like backstory, I guess, with, uh, you know, what, what is kind of going on with me and like inside of Spirit Mysteries and stuff, because we talk about that kind of stuff a lot. And, and I think part of it even is um, really relating it with the biology of belief is like, if you believe in it and are striving towards that, there's you like are basically asking your DNA to help you to make that happen as opposed to if you just are like never going to, ha I'm, there's nothing special about myself and my life, then the DNA is like, all right, those are the codons we'll turn on or those are the, you know, the genes that we'll turn on and, or not turn on, but like we'll, you know, translate into RNA, into proteins and, and that's the life that you, you kind of live. So uh, it's just such a fascinating conversation. Like I, su I just, I'm, I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's exciting it's exciting right it's like the doctor strange reality it's like yes we can get there yeah um, right <laughs> and, and that's and that's the piece that i i'm like okay that comes up a lot is two different things one is this relevancy right relevancy the guy like literally needed to save people like it was it was relevant and i think that that's an important piece to realize too is that these things don't happen like when they're like, be psychic, what am I thinking? It's like, it's not relevant. Like part of the gifts are to be used for something. And so I think that that's important to remember. And then the other piece that I always tell myself <laughs> and other people is to remember that 
to remember, acknowledge the gifts that you already do have. What is mm. already working for you and super, super acknowledge that because you, you're like, oh yeah, I, you know, I was on, like I was on mushrooms and cannabis or whatever. And then these reptilian beans like just came in and I was like, Hey guys. And they're like, what are you doing? And it's like, <laughs> that is, that, that is a really special experience. It's so natural to you that it's like, yeah, you know, kind of like whatever, but it's, that's not, you know, a normal, you know, 90, at least, at least not 95% of the population kind of experience. And so like acknowledging those little pieces and acknowledging those spiritual experiences. And for me, I make sure to document them, whether it's a dream time encounter, whether it's just like some cool synchronicity during the day or some like new gift that turns on or something like that. Like I have a journal for those because it's like, I must acknowledge what is already here so that then more can happen. Right. Yeah. And so that one's a big one for me. Cause sometimes I do that too. I'm like, come on, you know, come on ETs or like what why isn't anything <laughs> happening for me right now you know and then I'm like a lot is happening a lot is happening let's acknowledge that and then it makes room for more mm -hmm. I think that's so beautiful too that you it's like it's really just grounding in like uh like humility and gratitude for your life and that that like feeling that and getting more into that gives you just it perpetually, you know, like, and it builds and it grows as opposed to like, son of a, I'm not psychic <laughs> enough yet. You know, and it's the universe is like your wish is my command that you're not psychic. <laughs> you're not psychic enough yet. And there you are, <laughs> as you so sh as you say. <laughs> I love it, Jordan. Um, totally. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the, like very recently, um, you know, before our call here, I was watching some of your YouTube videos and I'm going to kind of change the subject a little bit here, but it's probably relative to everything. Um, uh -huh. One of the videos that I watched was a recent uh, sort of interview slash video conversation you, you had with our friend Jocelyn. Um, yeah. And, and I really loved that you were talking about really like that, the wild woman and the wild self archetypes. And um, I recently have been reading why well, I've been through Iron John, which is the, the, the wild masculine. And I'm currently going through, I did the audiobook of Women Who Run With Wolves. And now I'm mm. reading the physical book because it's like, you know, it's eight times longer um, of the, yeah. And, and really finding it to be, they're, both of them are very relevant, not just like the masculine because of a, a guy or whatever. But I find both of them to be very impactful and powerful. And I was wondering maybe if I could just get you to, to speak a little bit more about like, what is that wild self and why is it important for people who are listening to this? Yeah. I, I, the, the wild self is critical. The wild self has been turned on by like civilization. Like this is civilized and this is wild and untamed. And that means that it's lower. That means that it's part of the ape, you know, nature or something like that. And what I've realized as I've explored it for myself, because again, my guidance directs me deeper to earth and like the deeper I go into earth and the deeper I go into the wild nature of nature being very balanced and harmonious, the more that it actually leads to the technologies of like anti-gravity. It's like when you know gravity, when you know the earth and that grounding, then you can actually start to understand the other side of it. So that's a piece of it. But for me, that wild aspect is really essential because it's untamed by the constraints of, of the matrix of of the bounds of reality to be honest i mean it doesn't say like you know there's all these dimensions and then extraterrestrials exist but it is saying i am open to exploring i'm an explorer i'm curious like i'm i'm listening i'm instinctual and part of the that getting back to that wild self i feel is connected to the psychic gifts it is connected to the perceptions that are beyond like the rational mind that are communicating with us like through all time. So I do feel like it actually gets us back to part of our, part of our more advanced way of being. And then particularly as a biological female and connecting with like the womb work and through sexuality and orgasm, it's like, man, you can fly to other planets. You can like, you can do so much creating, you can do so much expansion but that's only available when there's a full surrender and release to uh, the natural self, 
right? And to this un, untamed self, there's something else that emerges and it's not just an animal. It's, it's, it's consciousness from a different perspective that is, I think, a big part of the full integration of everything that we're talking about. Mm. I think that was really well said. Yeah, like our, that just like the, the conditioning, this is probably the, one of the biggest factors. Well, I mean, it, the whole thing has just been such a wonderful journey to learn about. Um, but yeah, like in the simplest sense for me was just like that, the, the conditioning of society of everything being so neat and orderly and, and don't get me wrong. I love it when things are clean, but you know, being able to experience within yourself the, the, I don't know if it's the chaotic, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but yeah, like that instinctual, much more natural, uh, like less programmed and conditioned thinking and more just like instinctive I guess and intuitive or yes or, yeah yeah it's yeah really powerful yeah that sparks the the concept of because I think that even in because I do different stuff with art and color and most people love the greens the blues the purples like that's like their spectrum you know and then in the art classes like the oranges and the reds and the yellows are just like always left and it's like no one wants to touch those chakras no one wants to touch those like (laughs) those colors those frequencies and so there's something about the wild self that's very connected to earth connected to the feet connected to the root connected to those lower chakras and when those lower chakras are, are allowed in a very like kind way to flow, then I love what you said. The intuitive comes Mm. through the instinctual comes through that gut instinct comes through. And those aren't lower energies. They're integral parts of the, of the spectrum of the rainbow of the chakras, as you know, and talk about so much. Um, So I think that's in part, another piece of it is it's the wild nature is turning on the lower centers. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you just kind of made this bridge for me too is like, maybe this is how it connects back to like even the very beginning of our conversation about like the reptilians and stuff is, you know, we have that, you know, it's the the higher cognitive brain, the mammalian brain and the reptile brain as these different like sections of our consciousness, sections of our, of our minds and our egos and personalities and how they work and function and operate. And it's almost like maybe, well, like a lot of the spiritual practices, um, even this is found in Kabbalah and in the tarot and like the concept of, uh, it's called Kuf, which is one of the, the Hebrew letters, speaks actually to the back of the head and it's speaking mm. to the cerebellum and describing that, y- you know, we are born with these very animalistic, in- instinctive um, capacities, but they're like very programmed, very, you know, at, at the lowest level, at that reptile brain level, it's programmed with that like fight or flight response kind of can be violent, can be, you know, if, if, you're, if your security is threatened, you could be animalistic and very intense. And then the, the, the Kabbalistic teaching is that through our consciousness, we can elevate and uh, we can work with those energies. We can work with that lower self and elevate its, its, our like, cognitive capacity to have much more complete control and awareness over our uh, you know, total conscious facilities, our entire body of consciousness. Yeah. And um, it's almost like maybe there's this, this bridge of like, you know, when you're meeting reptiles or if you're controlled by reptiles, maybe it's because you're not fully operating from the heart or from the higher consciousness, you're operating f- mostly from that reptile brain or there's more energy that's, you know, like going through that part of your mind uh, as opposed to other parts of your mind or you're you know, exercising the higher mind as much. And I just wonder like, maybe there's, maybe there's a relationship there too. And like the wild self being like the integrated soul into those parts of your brain and the, the full, the full mind. Um, but not shutting it down at the same time, not saying like, well, the reptile brain is bad, but like acknowledging it and working with it and and, and allowing it to be free also, but within the con within the greater construct of your collective awareness, because in addition to having that lower self, you also have a supremely higher self, you know, maybe there's, there's something to be said about that relationship. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the idea, right? We, I said it before, it's like acknowledgement. And it's like, when you acknowledge, then you heal. And so there's something about like the avoidance of down there, you know, like whether it's operating from down there, which a lot of people do, or the avoidance of like, I'm not even going to look down there, 
But then if you're not looking at it, you're not conscious, which means that other energies can come in and then actually manipulate you through it. So it's like you might as well be conscious of your own self down there and just, you know, then just look at it, just work on it, you know, kindly. And there's, man, I've done so many different, I've, I've helped lots of different people and worked on myself so much that it's like, you know, kind of the scariest things that can come up down there, you know, the idea of rape or the idea of possession or manipulation or control or like, you know, these things that we're scared of where it's like, I just, I'm just not going to look at that. And it's like, when you do, everything can just melt and it can start to move. But the second you're scared of it, it just is going to continue to perpetuate, you know, and be haunting in that way. So, um, yeah, I agree with you. It is like, how do we bring, yeah. How do we bridge that gap between, Mm. between like the lower self and the higher self and, and bring kindness to the whole, the holistic puzzle of it, you know? Yeah. I might imagine, I guess, if you're just looking at it from the chakra system that like, you know, through the heart would be the way to do that, you know, the lower self, the higher self, just, and then you're doing that also in your mind, you're doing that in your lower centers, just like bringing everything to unity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, um, the last thing that I have here on the list of like things that, uh, well, to talk about, again, granted, it just goes on and on, like we could go on forever. This is great, but um, is is really like the the kind of earth energy, everything, everything from like earth chakras, ley lines, uh, earthing, you know, like just getting on the earth and everything like that. And I think, yeah. you know, you've mentioned already, like I re- even when we were talking about like learning to levitate or whatnot, it's like, you know, if you get on the planet and you get on the earth and you feel mm-hmm. gravity, it's only when you understand and know gravity well enough that maybe you can play with it on the other side. Um, I really like that idea. And uh, you've just done a lot of work, haven't you, with ley lines and earth energy. And you mentioned that even earlier on in this, in this talk. Um, I mean, how, like, what is the most exciting thing about all of that to you? Like, why, why is that something that you're super passionate about? Yeah, I mean, it's exciting to me. And you, you know, all the history, you've, you've done all the work as well in the way that these these sites, there, there were alignments, you know, with the different like solstices, there were alignments with different locations that then created with the different megaliths or technologies, ancient technologies, stargates and dimensional gates to communicate, to expand consciousness, to travel, to do whatever you wanted to do. And so for me, it's, it's connecting back with that idea. It's like, what's the ultimate earth technology we have right and the natural grid system is it and the sites the ancient sites that are still existing also still do have an immense amount of power and energy and so for me it is about um being able to tap into that technology tap into the that level of consciousness to expand my own to you know spark different experiences and and bring up most of these sacred sites because I've lived in sacred sites for um, the past 10 years, they bring up stuff too. So it's not just like all like fun and games as well, but they amplify the energy for acceleration of awakening that much more quickly. Um, And so I dig that. Like I kind of, I kind of like that energy. Um, And so it's just the communication um, for me and the, the energy that's available. And so I like taking people to these places and exposing them um, to nature, but to these energies and to realize that they can feel them. So we'll be in Glastonbury and I'll be like, Hey, just walk, walk, you know, 20 feet right there. And then they'll be like, Oh my, I felt something. I'm like, yeah, you're walking through a ley line. You know, your body knows like there's, there's this empowerment around it and really working with energy in that way. Cause right now I feel like, you know, in most places, in most cities, it's kind of like on the defense of electromagnetics. And you're kind of not wanting to feel like a lot of empathic people are not wanting to feel. And for me, these sites open up the capacity and the spaciousness to just absolutely feel. And the more that you feel and the more that you open and the more that you connect, the more that you can receive guidance and receive upgrades and learn from the ancients of the past to or the past that is now to what we can do right now moving forward as a humanity right and how to kind of make up for those mistakes of Atlantis or those other energies um and move forward in a benevolent way so that's part of why it excites me 
Mm, that's so cool. Yeah, that's very fascinating. I mean, like, there's so many ideas now about, like, you know, why the Great Pyramids or the Pyramids of Egypt were, existed at all. And there are these theories that it was a giant, uh, you know, electromagnetic field generator and everything like that. And actually, I, we, we just produced a video. Um, it hasn't been published yet, at least at the time of recording this, but uh, it will soon. It's a, a video about pyramid power. And how like the Russian, there's actually like Russian scientists who have done all this work on like pyramid yes. energy of like, you build a pyramid and suddenly it's like cleaning out the atmosphere, healing the holes in the ozone, or like growing crops better and like sharpening razor blades by changing the molecular, the magnetic field inside of it. And elect you run electricity through a pyramid and it gets five times more powerful and like more voltage or wattage or whatever it is. Like, that's so unbelievably outstanding like everybody should have a pyramid in their backyard to, to increase the energy just on just on energy alone let alone all the other health benefits and the, I, I always thought it was crazy of like when I learned about that you know what they said was that there was like they put medicine inside of a pyramid and the medicine became like 5,000 times more potent and I'm like what, what, what would happen if you put like some LSD in there or some ayahuasca in there like what would happen to it oh uh, it's such a crazy idea um but like that's remarkable like that's so amazing that like a single shape can do that you know um definitely something like if there's any technology that we need to pair with the understanding of ley lines we could probably re-transform our civilization in a in, in a in a generation you know in a, in a decade if we just took something like that seriously and just got to work on it and put the resources where they needed to be to build some really cool stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it's amazing too, even just the, even the, cause the pyramid shape and all of that is just like, yeah, profound. And it's like, okay, I get why you were doing that. Why like so many pyramids were built around the planet and why in part, at least from my historical research, um, that's what they were trying to do in Atlantis to stop the catastrophe is to use the pyramids and plant them around the planet to, to stop the imbalances that they had created. Um, and it didn't work, but you know, they, they did their best to almost get there. Um, but then even just the energy, cause I, I'm very connected to like the, the Celtic Isles. And so like the stone circles and like, you know, the obelisks and those kinds of energies. And it's amazing how even just a standing stone, right. Which they were doing the same thing with would create the scalar energy field which then would help the crops or do whatever it, you know, may be in all those categories they said, create the fertility for the land or the people and all these different things. And so even connecting with, cause I've gone from like the actual physical sacred sites of what has been built to then realizing, okay, basalt or granite, you know, some of these actual natural stones create this energy, especially if it's in a certain shape, you know, like a pyramid, but connecting just even with like a granite mountain, or a basalt volcano, you know, and realizing like the potency that exists there, which creates like all the energy of Hawaii or all the energy of these different places. So it's kind of taken me to, to acknowledging the amazing energies just everywhere around the planet and that the planet itself already has everything it needs to balance itself. If we just kind of chill out and acknowledge it and sync with that energy, which we can only do through that wild release you know back again to the wild self so it all it all like circles back like it it seems like they're all different random tangents but it all kind of connects back so they really do yeah i, I remember i had a friend once who uh i was kind of asking him i had just met him it was like probably a month ago or so um is a friend who's passing through town a mutual friend of ours or whatever but um i was like what do you you know what do you do and he's like well i'm in school for this like geoengineering this and that kind of thing and i'm like oh that's very cool like what do you like, what are you working on? And, and he's like, well, like, you know, humans through our science have like created an, an, an imbalance in this part of nature. And so we're trying to find out what we can do to create a balance. And I'm like, have you considered just like leaving it alone? Because <laughs> <laughs> we're constantly trying to like, well, we've messed it up. So what can we do to fix it? And then, you know, trying to add more things. But even as ev evidenced by like COVID and everything is like when, when humans just like stop messing with shit, you know, like life gets better. Like, like life just sort of knows what to do and fixes the imbalances as long as it's not constantly being messed with. And he laughed and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I'm still going to do that work. Like he was, you know, kind of in that, that mindset, I guess, but it was still a really fun conversation to have. And 
uh, yeah, I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I love that. That is hilarious. It's so true. It's so true. And yeah, we are totally seeing that with COVID, whether the dolphins and the Venice canals is actually real or not, but it's just There's like, at least fish. Yeah. There's good. There's fish. Yeah. And so yeah. if that's, if that's the case, or even just looking at Chernobyl, right. After the bombing, it, things have you seen that like things are growing back like there's like trees growing in the buildings all the animals have come back and it's still like radioactive mm. like no humans go in there but, like nature's just kind of taking it back over and like everything's living there healthy and it's like wow like if that's possible so it's it's it's, it's beautiful it's extremely hopeful to me um that yeah that nature restores itself and balance just restores itself so easily and effortlessly yeah, definitely. No, I mean, all, all it takes is us getting out of the way. That's, that's just so funny. But yeah, and maybe there's something that we can relate that even just like for ourselves and our own growth, you know, relating to the evolution of consciousness and whatnot, is like, if we get out of our own way, if we get out of our, you know, our thinking mind and get back to that natural, instinctive, intuitive animal self, things just work. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Bridget, this has been an absolutely amazing call. I'm so grateful to have had you join me for Spirit Science Live. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you so much for having me, Jordan. It's a pleasure. And yeah. I just always loved you and everything that you're doing for the movement. Thank you. Um, so listen, for, for anybody out there watching who wants to tune in to, to you and your work, where can they find you? Um, probably the best place is YouTube. So my YouTube channel, Bridget Nielsen. Um, mm -hmm. You can figure out the spelling through this somehow. Uh, and then um, through my website, BridgetNielsen.com and Instagram and then hybridchildrencommunity.org. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jordan. Really <laughs> appreciate it. Cool. Well, have yourself a beautiful day and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Sounds great.